Welcome to Assembly Calendar. I'm Ted Flint. With us today, Assemblyman Pete Lopez, who serves the 127th Assembly District, that inclu which includes the Mid-Hudson, Northern Catskills, and the Southern Sierra. Yes, a very large district it is, and you tack yes. on quite a few miles every year. I, I do. We're still uh, averaging about 1,000 miles a week. Um, so mm -hmm. my little Jeep, uh, which uh, after 150,000 miles in our family, we name our vehicles. So, uh, so my little biodiesel, uh, Eugene, uh, is now at about uh, 202. <laughs> Eugene the Jeep is about uh, 202,000 miles. Really? Uh, running strong. I, I'm hoping to get another 100,000 out of it. So, uh, hmm. so we'll see. It's more than uh, paid for itself, I guess. Well, or it has. has. It? Or has it? <laughs> it, it well, it, it, it has, uh, but, but to the extent that, uh, uh, again, given the terrain and the nature of the district, um, the Jeep's been an ideal vehicle for me. And, and again, I'm running on biofuel, so it's mm -hmm. a, a blend of, of uh, uh, canola and, and uh, vegetable oil. Uh, with diesel. So uh, if you smell up uh, like McDonald's driving by, uh, it's probably me and Eugene. <laughs> okay. A couple of good lines there, but I'll, I won't go there. Okay, fair enough. Uh, let's talk uh, about uh, the fact that we're in May. Yes, when this we This program are. airs, so yep. it'll, be, uh, it'll be May. Right. Two months left of the legislative session, right. and what would you like to see done, and what hasn't been done yet that you'd like to see well, uh, taken up? And, and I'm glad you raised that. As we, we've gotten through the budget process, and there was a lot of um, back slapping and, and um, self uh, self congratulation throughout the throughout the, the legislature legislature and and the governor's office as a whole and granted the budget was passed and granted we met job one which was to stabilize New York State fiscally so so that in and of itself is noteworthy the the underlying premise though was that this was the, the initial uh, foray into a broader and deeper activity of reassessing where we are as a state, redeveloping our economy, right-sizing our agencies, making best use of taxpayer dollars so that we can meet human need, but also be sustainable. So, so after the dust settled with the budget, we, we kind of ha have been in this sargasso sea. Really, it's just been a, 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 a calm, mm -hmm. no direction, and I'd have to say, in some cases, um, running afoul, going, going off in, in directions that really are not in the best interests as a priority to the taxpayers and the people we're serving. So any number of one-house bills are popping up. Agendas have been very light, just a few mm -hmm. bills on the agenda. Um, yeah. Lots of rhetoric, uh, lots of, of uh, grandstanding. But the real problem-solving piece is missing. And so as we look at two months, two months is not a lot of time. Um, for some, they would say two months with the, the legislature in Albany is too much time, uh, depending on the, on the outcomes. But not a lot of time to address how do we keep our schools affordable and quality? How, how do we address energy issues? We see gas prices spiking mm -hmm. and people struggling. I just filled little Eugene, um, almost $90. And that, I'm getting 30 miles to the gallon with that little thing. You know, almost $90 in fuel for a fill-up. So, so those are critical issues that, that have not been coming to the fore. That's my frustration right now, and, and that's where we need to be. Mm -hmm. um, you know, recently, we, just before the break, and here's, here's the other piece, many of my colleagues were more interested in the break. <laughs> you and I did the radio show on this. this yeah. before, that, than in, in real substantive engagement. Yeah. Some of them, if you can imagine, were pre tanned <laughs> I, I kid you not. <laughs> No, I had someone talk to me because we talked about the foot. I had someone approach me because we talked about the members getting the foot massage. Yeah. Remember we talked oh, yeah. about that. Yeah. And it kills me because I have to tell you, this is what I deal with. I'm just venting to you now. That's but, fine. But um, as a young college student, again, we come from working family, lower middle class. I was, I was very frustrated, um, resentful, if you would, of some of my contemporaries who had everything handed to them and did nothing with it. They were partying. They were blowing off classes. I was working 20 hours a week. I was scrubbing floors on my hands and knees. I was there vested in, in my education and, and there for reason and, and just making it, just, just barely making it. Again, family and others helping. So now 30 years later, I'm disclosing my age here. Now 30 years you later. You are close. Yeah, we're age. close. Yeah. 30 years later, I suffer with the same frustration. As I, as I look at not all, but many of my colleagues who are, it, it's, more of, it's more like vacation. It's more like, like 
uh, yeah. dorms and co-eds it's like and you're dorms. In school. It feels yeah. has a feel to I, it. And, yeah. and I'm the commuter yeah. still. Yeah. I'm the commuter. I'm working. I'm going back and, ho back and forth to the district, which is close by. I'm working my tail off. And I see all this potential and all this ability and all this uh, capability being wasted. And that's my biggest frustration because there are capable, intelligent people who, if they came together, we could be making some real, real uh, inroads. You know what I'm talking about. I do. And, and there, there's a bill we're going to talk about now that's a, a yeah. perfect illustration. Equal pay for comparable work. Right. Uh, what is wrong with this bill in your view? Well, here's the frustration. The, the law of the land is equal pay for equal work. Un, undeniable, regardless of age, regardless of ethnicity, regardless mm -hmm. of gender. If you are in a job and your job is deemed to be equal, the same job, and you get equal pay. So, so time and service, ability, performance, all those things factor in as variables. Yeah. Equal pay for equal work. The, the, the bill that came to the floor, I should say there were five or six bills. They were like different That's flavors of vanilla. Yeah. It was almost like Groundhog's Day. You ever watch that movie? With, I have. Yeah. It's over like, and over. Yeah, that was it. <laughs> over and over. It was the same yeah. bill, basic premise, just different flavors of the bill. But, but the premise was, well, if your work has some job skills and some some elements that are similar to another job, well, we're going to let government come in and interpret, and then we're going to adjust the pay for the other job so that if it's comparable, so it's just, if you can imagine, it, it's, it leaves a nightmare. It, it's almost like the real property tax, where, where it's not an exact science, it's someone's opinion, an estimate of, of the worth. So now we're going to inject bureaucracies and government and the courts into, into saying, well, if you're over here and you're doing this job, and this job is over here and it's roughly equivalent, we're, we're going to draw a magic line. But, but here's the rub. We're, we're, the market forces have nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. What the market is paying for either of those jobs has nothing to do with it. And it's unidirectional. So if you're working here, even if market forces say that's where the, the, uh, the pay should be, and the other jobs over here and they're getting higher pay, it's a one-way street to the higher pay. So, so in all honesty, it's pandering to special interests. And it has nothing to do with reality, has nothing to do with the economy, nothing to do with sustainability, nothing to do with job creation, mm -hmm. nothing to do with all those issues. Takes some market I forces turned myself out, out here. Takes some market forces out of it. It has nothing to do with, with all those things that are so urgent that we should be dealing with. And more offensively, they were bills that, that many of them had no sponsorship in the Senate. Mm -hmm. They one call them one-house one house bill. bills. As you mentioned earlier, yeah, it's, that's right. What's going and and on so here. I just wore myself out there, but but you understand where, where what I'm driving. I at. do. So much need, so well, many yeah. issues, so many people yeah. suffering, and we're stuck on one house bills. So someone can 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 stand up and posture, rather than address real world issues. And there'll be a few more of those bills before the end of session right. too, and you know what they are. We'll get to them as the yes, session wears on. Yes, I had to vent, so we got it out of my system. Let's look at thank your you. uh, your opposition to the uh, equal pay for thank comparable, comparable work, right. and then we'll come back with you. Assemblyman Pete Lopez. Again, I, I've made clear to this body what existing policy of the state of New York is, including providing the people and the taxpayers the highest return in services. And what we've clearly heard from our, well, not so clearly, no offense, but what we've heard from our sponsor is that that doesn't matter in regard to this legislation. This legislation just wants to make pay the same, regardless of whether it meets the acid test of being an appropriate salary and the best return to the taxpayer of the state of New York. In my opinion, that runs counter to what we should be here for. If we're looking for fairness, fairness should be across all, all, uh, all permutations. Fairness to the individual, fairness to the taxpayer, fairness to other coworkers. This bill is inherently unfair because it's biased from its start. And it, it is biased against the taxpayers of the state because it presumes that a higher salary is the only answer. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I will be voting in the negative. I do encourage my, uh, my, uh, the sponsor of the bill to possibly reconsider her position, and thank you. I'll be voting in the negative. Interesting debate that night, I recall that. It was. It was an hours. We were there hmm. four, five, yep. six hours, uh, yeah. but, but again, debating the same issue over and over, yeah. like Groundhog's Day. It is. That's what happens huh. here at the state often. Let's talk about the maple industry. Sure. The maple season, about a month removed as we tape this program. Cri critical industry to the state of New York. And I have to say, as I continue working with the new administration, 
Uh, I just had this conversation recently with Ken Adams, who's the new uh, CEO for Empire State Development, former president and CEO of the Business Council. And we'll get into this with another project. But I said, Ken, we have a tremendous opportunity in New York. Value-added processing of local food, sustainable food, um, our food, uh, supporting uh, local producers, family farms, and growing in our economy really in an opportunity to feed New York State, which is a net importer, if you can imagine. We, we, we import more than we produce in New York State. And reports have shown over time as much as importing 80% of our food uh, in a state where we have millions of people to feed, and in the greater metropolitan uh, area, t tens of millions of people to feed. So the maple uh, producers, uh, again, uh, New York State, upstate, rural New York, uh, fill an important niche, and we want to make sure that they can remain competitive, just as we do with dairy farmers and vegetable farmers. So highlighting segments and, and understanding the diversity even within different producers is critical. Years ago, uh, I uh, served on staff of the Ag Committee. Uh, I'd come from a background on rural issues. I thought, how can that keep me engaged, just agriculture? Once I got into it, I was stunned at the array and the diversity of issues. So. Maple producers are critical. We actually had them in Albany. You did. We have a couple of producers and some princesses. And some princesses. And yeah. let's let's take a look at that sure. introduction. Thank you. And we're back with Assemblyman Pete Lopez. I've known the Van Glads for for many years, and, and clearly they're very committed to agriculture, to the maple industry, and other forms of production agriculture. And, and clearly, those of us in this room understand the importance of local farms and local food. And these folks exemplify uh, the very best that New York can bring. So if you could please uh, welcome them to the House. Uh, yeah, Mr. President. It's always nice to have royalty in here. It's always nice to have a princess in here to uh, remind us what's, uh, what's key in our culture and in our society. So on behalf of Mr. Crouch, on behalf of Mr. Peter Lopez, the speaker, and all my colleagues, we welcome you to the floor. We extend the privileges of the floor to you. We ask you to come back real soon. Thank you for being with us here today. That minute and a half left, Pete. Um, let's uh, talk about some, you know, this actually, this is real, real life stuff. Back to here. the real world. Back to the real That's world. Right. That's got a, right. We've got a project in Springbrook, uh, Spring 100 jobs possibly? Right. Um, just on the outskirts of my district, we were working with a, a provider of services for special needs uh, children in particular. And New York State was outsourcing autism services from this institution, spending millions of dollars a year. What we did, working with Senator Seward, my colleague, and the Department of Budget, we've uh, in, in enlarged their capital facility, uh, their, their facility, and are now bringing those jobs back. As we do that, creating 100 new jobs and saving the state, if you can imagine, somewhere between eight and $900,000 a year for out-of-state tuition placement. So we are now in the process, the facility's built, we're now advertising, holding job fairs in the region. Critical, uh, again, right-sizing government, making best use of dollars, and keeping our dollars local. So mm -hmm. that's, a, that's, that's a win -win. one project. Yeah, it's very exciting. And uh, we hope to do some job fairs locally. Some are uh, beginning in the Oneonta area right now. 30 seconds, the dairy producer uh, you're working with in the Mid-Hudson, with whom you're working, I should say, to be Re grammatically correct. Real quick, and I'll come yeah. back to this. Uh, again, value-added manufacturing. We're working to bring a producer from France, a uh, producer of goat cheese, if you can imagine, uh, to the region to create 50 new jobs initially and then strengthen uh, our farms locally by producing directly for that facility and growing that facility. Similar to the, uh, uh, the New Yorker plant in uh, Shenango County. All right, we'll follow up next show. Thank you. Thank you very much. We covered a lot of ground. A lot of ground. Assemblyman Pete Lopez, yeah. good to have you with us. Good to have you too. On this edition of Assembly Calendar, we'll see you soon. I'm Ted Plank.